Hey, this is just a quick note about our sponsor, Pravado, the premier enterprise privacy platform, purpose-built to bridge the gap between privacy and engineering. Its privacy code scanning solution embeds privacy compliance and governance into the product development lifecycle and empowers privacy and security teams with unparalleled visibility of sensitive data flows and the insights to find and fix privacy vulnerabilities. You can leverage Provado's data flows, dynamic data mapping, privacy assessment automation, and real-time visibility of privacy issues. Enter the era of proactive privacy and transform privacy from business blocker to business enabler. To learn more, go to provado.ai. Hello, I am Deborah J. Farber. Welcome to the Shifting Privacy Left podcast, where we talk about embedding privacy by design and default into the engineering function to prevent privacy harms to humans and to prevent dystopia. Each week, we'll bring you unique discussions with global privacy technologists and innovators working at the bleeding edge of privacy research and emerging technologies, standards, business models, and ecosystems. Today, I'm delighted to welcome my next guest, Jeff Jokish, partner at Avantis Privacy, data privacy researcher at Privacy Plan, and co-host of the weekly LinkedIn event, or yeah, I guess we call it a podcast as well, called Your Bites, Your Rights which focuses on town hall style discussions around ownership, digital rights, and privacy. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks, Deborah. Great to be here. Wonderful to chat. Absolutely. It's been too long since we've caught up. So why not do it publicly on this radio show, right? <laughs> this podcast. <laughs> I know you did not start out working in privacy. Um, and at Privacy Plan, where you've been for a while, you've been focusing on data sets like specifically privacy data sets, privacy consulting, and privacy training. And your website states that you, quote unquote, research and create data sets about data privacy to gain insight into the privacy landscape. Can you give us some context as to what you mean by privacy data sets? Maybe your approach to creating them and uh, what you mean by gaining insight into the privacy mm. landscape. Yeah, absolutely. I guess that's actually a few questions. It kind of uh, is. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it, it, it sort of gets to the core of who I am. You know, I sort of grew up in in technology and I guess sort of marketing technology, sort of the other side of the equation from privacy. And uh, I actually worked in a search engine for a long time before I got into privacy. And that was sort of my introduction to it, doing some work in can spam and, and COPA uh, as part of a, a, an SMS based search engine. I won't really go into that because it's a little bit deeper, but you know, I really built a lot of, a, a lot of data sets when I was doing that, essentially building out a knowledge graph on the back end of a search engine. And that's really uh, where I sort of cut my teeth on data science and, and, and building data sets. And I really love doing that. So when I get into privacy, I really loved the privacy world, but I didn't really want to do what everybody else in privacy did. I didn't really want to work on compliance. And I realized as I was studying for my CIPPUS that the way I was studying for it was building data sets of like privacy laws, you know, to sort of study them and building data sets of like privacy podcasts that I was listening to to learn. And it occurred to me that that I like to build structured data sets and that I could do that in the privacy world. And so I just really sort of fixated on that. And I started building, I guess, sort of massive data sets around different things. So I've got like a huge data set of privacy laws, like all the privacy laws in the United States, and not just like a list of them, right? All the different attributes and things like that. And probably there are like law firms and stuff that, you know, and, and organizations that do that. But I built a lot of other things like, you know, data sets of privacy podcasts, right? Uh, data sets of you know, all the different aspects of privacy regulators uh, across the world. I think I've got maybe one of the largest ones of that and data sets of privacy brokers and all aspects of like data breach laws in the United and in the States, right? And all the different things that happen there. When we start sort of analyzing those data sets and looking at all the different attributes, you really learn a lot. And that's sort of where you get those insights. That makes a lot of sense. And it definitely uh, explains kind of 
you know, you're a data guy, you know, that's how you kind of got into doing privacy data sets and just ch- kind of shows that people get into privacy from all different angles, you know, whether it's being a developer and coming in and starting to, you know, or be a, a privacy engineer uh, writing code or privacy ar- uh, architects coming over from other spaces to work on privacy or compliance folks, GRC folks, lawyers. I just, you are absolutely the first person that I have ever met that has worked on data sets, which really drew me to you a few years back when I kind of saw the work that you were making public. Now, I know you recently uh, started working for a company called Avantis Privacy to work on location privacy and deletion. And I think we're going to center some of our conversation today mostly around location privacy. And so I'd love to, you know, hear you elaborate on the work that you're doing there. Sure. And that was actually a little bit of an outgrowth of uh, of what I was doing at Privacy Plan, so sort of still doing it at Privacy Plan. So as part of my research at Privacy Plan, I built a data set of data brokers. I found that nobody in the world, it appears to me, was really tracking them. There are actually a few organizations, and frankly, there are a couple of state laws that require data brokers to register, Uh, one in California, one in Vermont. A couple other states are trying to pass some of those laws now, but only about a little less than a 1,000, probably close to around 800 data brokers have actually registered. But we know way back in 2014, um, the FTC estimated there were about 4,000 data brokers, uh, probably a lot more now. We've actually got a database of 3,000, uh, actually 3,200 data brokers right now. Wow. How did you find them? Well, um, painstakingly, I sort of built that data set over three years now and from a variety of different sources, sort of starting there you know, with that sort of 800 and building it out uh, in a variety of different ways. Part of that's proprietary methodology, but a lot of it is just scouring the internet for data sets where somebody says, this is a data broker, that's a data broker, and combining every data set of data brokers I can find and growing it from there. And then a lot of people sort of list and say, hey, you know, um, I'm a data broker and these are my data sources. And if you just keep adding all of that up painstakingly over time, you end up with a lot. You know, and sometimes, you know, I go into individual markets and say, okay, well, who are the healthcare data brokers? Who are the political data brokers? Who are the location data brokers? Who are, you know, and have to, you know, individually in different market segments, try to find who are the brokers. It's just a lot of work. Absolutely sounds like a lot of work. That's an astounding number. I I mean, I'm not surprised that there's that many data brokers, but I am uh, in awe of the fact that you've been able to identify and, you know, kind of tag uh, that many. Yeah. So with Advantage Privacy, you've been working on, you know, helping to delete geolocation data, right? I mean, what what is your yeah. uh, approach there? Yeah. So what, what happened was, right, as I was sort of building this data broker data set, one of the guys from Avantis, uh, one of the original two founders there, approached me and wanted to uh, to chat. I actually did some consulting for them, and I ended up coming on board with that organization. And now I've sort of uh, became a full partner there. And they Avantis's approach originally was to actually be a data deletion service, sort of like you know, um, Incogni, Optory, Privacy B, Delete Me, right? But uh, one of the things we realized early on is that nobody was deleting location data. And part of that is because the location data brokers, uh, until the FTC sued Kachava last year, really were not letting people delete their location data. It was not really an option. They all claimed that that data was anonymous and therefore not personal data and not necessarily deletable. But um, they very quickly started putting changes into their privacy policy and throwing up delete pages, right, where you could enter your maid and maybe email address and delete that information uh, once the FTC sued Kachava. And so now it's possible to delete your location data, but people don't know who those brokers are. They don't know how to find their MAID, their the mobile uh, ID number, and they don't even know it's a thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, before this conversation, I, I've been in privacy. I talk about location data. Yeah. I didn't even know 
but I'm not like an expert in brokers, right? Like right. I didn't even know that location brokers were kind of a separate category from a data broker. Right. They are. Can you break and... down the difference there. Cause yeah. like that is definitely something I think people would be interested in, in learning more about. Yeah. Uh, we've got 150 location data brokers defined that are, that are storing these, uh, your mobile advertising ID as well as, you know, series of lat longs places where you've been right your home your office your you know your shopping locations your church your your gym you know every place you've been and all the routes you used to get there and they've got all this information and they're selling it frankly to just about anybody with a credit card it's not necessarily quite that easy to buy it but it's not hard either yeah and so let's explore that what are some of the current risks to our location privacy i mean there's i know there's a lot to expound on here so I'll, I'll let you answer first and maybe we'll go deeper. <laughs> well, there are, there are a lot of risks to your location and a lot of ways that your location leaks. We're actually trying to put together a little bit of a categorization system uh, of what those different location risks are and, and where your location ends up. And, and frankly, your, your MAID is really only one of those vectors, but it's a very large one and one that people don't really understand. And that's what one of the reasons we're focusing on it, right? Because you can, you know, you can delete your sort of profile information from data brokers and that'll get rid of things like, you know, how, e how easily your address is exposed to like people search websites, right? And that's something that the other deletion services can do reasonably well, maybe not perfectly, but decently well, right? But they're not getting at this other, you know, MAID information. And then there are other things, you know, where you're, you're exposing your, your location information in a variety of other ways too, like social media posts, right? Your car, you know, when you drive it around exposes your information, sometimes through your mobile uh, ID information, also through automated license plate readers, right? And uh, through some other things like um, other other ways through your car, plus your phone can also leak some data through cell tower information and a variety of other ways, though they're a little bit harder for like non law enforcement uh, organizations to get at. What are the restrictions there? Why? Uh, actually, before I get to the restrictions of why it's hard for law enforcement to get at some of this data, you know, I did want to kind of expound upon the risks to our location privacy, right? I mean, like what some of the privacy harms that could occur. Obviously, there's tracking like. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. Actually, I was sort of talking about the the sort of the types of data rather than. Yeah. The yeah. Risks that's fine. You right? could <laughs> switch gears. Yeah. Well, so the risks are, it sort of depends upon who you are, right? If people have your location, if you're an at-risk target, they can do a lot, right? I mean, it, first of all, it's a physical safety risk. If people know where they are, they can come and get you, right? If you're, if you have enemies, right? If you have somebody who's pissed off at you because you said something on social media, they can find you. They can, you know, come and, you know, come after you. They can swat you. We know this is a growing problem, right? They can, you know, you know, send people after you, which, which is sort of bad, right? If you got a stalker, they can come to your house. They can find out where you work and go there. They can, you know, intercept you on your way places. That's a, a really huge problem for people that are celebrities or athletes or CEOs or people that have got stalkers, domestic, you know, abuse victims, things like that, certain types of people. But even if you just are a regular person, right, you really don't want your location to be out there because uh, identity thieves can then use that information to to commit crimes in your name, right? They If they know where you live and they know lots of things about you, it, it's much easier to impersonate you, right? So those are a couple of the the, the really biggest risks. I guess, I guess that's where I'd sort of leave it there. There, there are other ones as well. Yeah, I, I was, so this might be one you're thinking and holding back, but I do want to bring up the risk of in a post Roe v. Roe v. Wade world now, where in a state like Texas, with Roe being overturned and with anybody being able to turn, you know, to pretty much accuse someone of having an abortion or seeking an abortion, which is now against the law in Texas, governments can use, uh, you know, law enforcement or governments can, can obtain this data to find someone and prosecute them or to check and see maybe maybe through a health app or or health data set that they get their hands on can tell that you've you know been near or to a uh, an abortion clinic or uh, that you went across 
state lines to an abortion clinic or something along those lines, right? Yep. Um, so law enforcement can even be a threat actor here to one's privacy, which is kind of scary. Yeah, with law enforcement or just your neighbor who doesn't like you, right? It's pretty scary. And to be clear, it's not just about women that have abortion in, in those circumstances, right? If you if you get pregnant, there are just as many circumstances where you don't actually carry the baby to birth, where it's not an abortion, where, you know, it's, you know, potentially a miscarriage or or some other circumstance where it's not an actual abortion. But somebody else who's who's looking at that from the outside might think it was an abortion when it wasn't, right? And they can accuse you of having an abortion, right? And put you through all kinds of circumstance and stress based upon some of these new laws that are that are put in place, right? And that's pretty horrendous. I, I agree. I think there's definitely um, some <laughs> fundamental harms that can that can happen as a result of uh, of getting access to that geolocation data. And then, so I guess to that point, I wanted to understand from you whether or not these location data brokers are always getting you know direct, precise information, or are they also inferring someone's location based on? behavior or uh, some other elements? So most of the data that we're looking at is is actual location data that is you know, based upon your GPS. Some of it is, you know, it can be Bluetooth. Some of it can be Wi-Fi. Some of it can be cellular. But generally, it's translated and then connected to your mobile uh, uh, advertising ID number. They can do inferences and stuff like that as well. And a lot of them do. But oftentimes those inferences, I think, are more like trying to impute whether or not based upon your path and stops that you were at a particular place or at another particular place, right? I don't know if you've ever been in Google, but sometimes, uh, you know, you drive by and you park in a in a parking lot and it doesn't know if you went to the grocery store or you went to the Dunkin' Donuts right next to it. You know, right. that kind of inferences are things that these folks might make, right? Did you go there or did you go to the mosque that was in the corner of the shopping mall, Right. So, you know, if you go to a mall that has a mosque in the corner, they might all of a sudden think that you're, you know, you're going there instead of, you know, going to the Dunkin' Donuts next to it. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I could see how that can be misused as well. You know, you previously said that the geolocation brokers in the past didn't really consider themselves data brokers. And I think you hinted that that's because they uh, had anonymized data. Yes. And so can you speak to that? What was... Why is anonymization not enough? Why does that not take them out of, you know, being covered by data protection laws or privacy laws or by the ruling, um, the Kachava ruling? Or, you know, just speak to us about uh, geolocation and anonymization and some of the challenges. Sure, sure. You know, anonymization has always been a way to essentially avoid privacy laws. And the problem is, is that for a while now, we have known that anonymized data can often be de-anonymized. And location data is particularly vulnerable to this kind of re-identification. If you take three precise geolocations, especially if it's got a time element attached to it, which all of this stuff does, right? Take three of those data points or even four, you can identify Americans with a 95 to to 97 percent accuracy. So if if I have four data points on you, just randomly from from some set of location data, Deborah, I can identify you 90, let's say 95 percent of the time that it's exactly you. Yeah, that's crazy. Right, because I, probably one of those data points is your house, one's your office, and one's your on the way to work on the highway. Right, and I can tell just from looking at those three or four points of data that it's you because it it can't be anybody else. Right. Because it's, you know, it's almost like a a behavioral pattern that's being recognized. Yeah, that's what it is. Right. And and this is proven, statistically proven. Right. There's a couple of articles. There's one from two years ago from Nature magazine that proves this. Right. And so it's it's impossible for these people to say that it can't be re-identified. Got it. But this is actually we've known this for a long time. I think it was back in like 2011, 2012, Lantana Sweeney from 
I forget where she's from, maybe MIT, uh, had, has done this research. So we've known about it for you know a decade. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hello, loyal listeners. The Shifting Privacy Left podcast is seeking sponsors who want to help educate our growing community of privacy engineers. Position your brand in front of privacy engineers, architects, developers, researchers, and privacy tech buyers. Insert a 30 to 60 second ad like this one into every published episode of the podcast. This is dynamic content after all. Feature your new product, an upcoming conference, a sponsored special deal, endless opportunities. Email sponsorship at shiftingprivacyleft.com for more information on our sponsorship package. Okay, let's get back to our engaging privacy conversation. Right, and yet because there weren't any regulations saying otherwise, so many ad brokers responses was just to anonymize. And um, I know you wrote about privacy theater. So on LinkedIn, I recently saw your post that reads, quote, location leakage coupled with consent theater is an existential threat to our privacy. For many, it's a threat to their physical safety and well-being. Can you elaborate on this, uh, you know, existential threat and what you mean by consent theater? I mean, I I have my ideas, but I'm, you know, obviously (laughs) want to hear from you. Yeah, well, the way this information gets collected is primarily from your smartphone, from apps, right? You are going to go and, you know, load up your smartphone and you're going to turn on a weather app, right? Because you want weather. You you need to know if it's going to rain tomorrow uh, or if it's going to rain in the next 15 minutes. I've got a weather app that I use that tells me when I look at it, if, you know, if I need to bring out the umbrella in the next 15 minutes. And it's highly accurate. It's got great NOAA data on it, right? But it also sends my location to a data broker. And that that location is connected to a mobile advertising ID. And it's going to get sold to Ventel and Kachava and Gravy Analytics and a whole bunch of other folks like that, right? And what people don't realize, though, is that that's happening. That just because they put this weather application on their phone and said, yeah, I want this application, that they're essentially agreeing to to give their location information to that application. And that application is going to monetize it by selling it to these location data brokers who they don't even they don't even know that they're there, that this ecosystem exists, or that information is going to get sold. And then that information, right, is going to go to anybody that wants to buy it, including law enforcement, homeland security, the FBI. Anybody can essentially get that data, right? And when the government's getting it, they're essentially circumventing the Fourth Amendment because they can get it without a warrant, right? You know, identity thieves can find easy ways to essentially buy that information. If I've got a stalker, that stalker can buy, they can't necessarily buy just my data. They can't walk into a data broker and say, give me Jeff Jokish's location, right? But if they happen to know what state I'm in, for instance, they could probably buy a swath of data, you know, in my state or my city, something like that. And then based upon that blob of data they got, they could probably figure out who I am if they know a little bit about me and be able to figure out more about me. You know what I'm saying? So if they knew, for instance, uh, where I worked and my name or, you know, they could probably figure out who I am. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, no, that definitely does make sense. And then getting all the consents, you know, the the check the box that everyone gives to uh, the privacy policy and, and, you know, just to move forward with, I don't know, installing an app on their phone or, or, or uh, on a website, um, you know, gaining access or creating an account. I'm assuming that that's the consent theater part where, yeah. you know, we can't possibly manage all of these, relationships and understand and remember everyone we've consented to using our data for what purposes. And I guess that obfuscation kind of. uh, Right. For me, the consent theater is this, right? I don't mind giving my location to the weather app, right? But what they're not telling me when I say okay to that is what happens to my location information downstream. It's completely non-obvious to me or to anybody else that that location information is going to be sold right. and is going to end up with Homeland Security, with you know potentially a threat actor, with potentially an identity thief. How is that possible? Yeah, I mean, it 
it shouldn't be. I think, uh, you know, I hate data brokers personally. I know that's something that Heidi Sass, who's a member of the Avantis team as well, she's always saying, I hate data brokers. Not afraid to say it here. Uh, you know, for the most part, they're trading on unsuspecting people who may have technically given consent, but not really knowing what they're consenting to and using their data sometimes selling it to their detriment of those people. So how can people protect themselves from having their data collected and sold by data brokers and location brokers? Sure. Well, I mean, there's really two phases to this, right? I mean, we can help delete the stuff that you've already leaked. You know, Avantis can help you delete that historical information. But you've also got to stop leaking the information, right? You've got to, you know, you've got to stop giving consent to, to these apps. And that can be a harder thing. We're also working on something that may be able to help with that, but that's for a, a later time and a later show. Oh, excellent. Because I was going to ask, you know, whether you think it's incumbent <laughs> upon the the phone manufacturers who, you know, have the, whether it's firmware or software or what, whatever, uh, that, that the pop-ups that are enabled to tell you what a particular app is going to use your data for. Do You know, I find that those top, you know, use it for marketing, use it for Customization. I find that yep. the reasons that developers can select are very broad, uh, so as not to really tell you the real purpose behind the data use downstream, but more of like a category that can be selected for j just so that they can move forward and start the data collection. You know, I feel like it needs to be more granular and, you know, it, it, or a allow apps to be able to notify individuals about a more granular uh, use of personal data. Yeah, I, I definitely agree, right? I mean, it needs to be more granular. It, need, you know, it would be great if there was something that said, hey, we're going to use your data, but we're never going to sell it, right, too, right? So, like, I'm going to use it for my marketing, but I'm not going to sell it to anybody who can sell it onward, right? That would be awesome if I could give my location to my, my weather app without having to give it to the whole world. Like yeah. that checkbox. Uh, yeah, so, uh, wouldn't we all? Uh, I, I only, it seems like that's that should be the way things are, right? Optimizing for uh, the benefit of humans and not necessarily, you know, for corporations to exploit them for the purposes of, you know, just making money off their data uh, that they didn't consent to. So I'm with you on that. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I actually think, you know, Deborah, that some of this is changing, right? I think some of this consent theater, well, what I've referred to it as, is is going to change a bit. I think, you know, the consent boxes are probably going to change a bit in the next couple of years. And, you know, there are companies like Apple, right, that are taking somewhat of a leadership role there, right? In terms of like MAIDs, because of the ATT framework that Apple rolled out, there are a lot of people that have opted out of that. So there are less people on the Apple uh, operating systems, iOS, that have their mobile advertising IDs turned on now than on Android, for instance. That's good, right? However, a lot of those people still have a lot of historical location data out there. So even if you're running an iPhone and you're like, oh, yeah, well, I turned off my mobile advertising ID. Well, that's awesome, right? Except even if you turned it off, you know, like six months ago all the data that you uh, let those companies collect for years is still sitting out there. Now, some of it might be older and maybe less valuable, but if you still live in the same house, go to the same office, go the same routes, all that data is still sitting out there for somebody to use against you. So that's a really great point. Uh, all it does is stop the data collection, but not necessarily purge it. So that's right. Uh, how could individuals you know, gain more control over their own data, uh, especially if we don't have a unified, at least in the United States, we don't have a equivalent of a GDPR. And we just have some states like uh, California, CCPA, and a few other states that have kind of followed suit with the privacy law. Well, like I said, Avantis can help you try to purge that data, right, with our location purge. Because we can, you know, with Apple, you can you can actually go back in, turn your MAID on, grab that MAID number, send it to us, and we can purge purge that information for you. It's actually harder on um, on Android. So on the Android devices, only three percent of people, roughly, have turned off their mobile advertising ID, which is sad. All right. However, there's a problem on Android, and that's this, right? If you have turned off your your advertising ID. There's no way to know what it used to be. So all of that historical information 
is now no longer reachable, right? So you can't turn your Android ID back on, figure out what it was, and then send that MAID to us so that we can delete that that past history. Unless you can figure out some other way to figure out what your ID was, it's like unreachable historical data. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's fascinating. So it's, yeah. So it sounds like a great idea to turn turn your MAID off, right? Except if you don't write that number down, you can no longer access your historical data from and all these brokers. Yeah, well, that's definitely a security-wise, that's a data availability problem now, potentially. Yep. I mean, arguably, could that be a good thing? Like, or, uh, it's no longer identifiable, potentially, or is it still going to get bought and sold? Still going to get bought and sold, and somebody, anybody who, you know, grabs more than three or four points of data can re-identify it and figure out it's you. Right. So if somebody deletes their ID off of Android, are you basically saying that Google will still track that ID even though that person is no longer like it's still it's not like considered like let's purge that data. It's not good anymore. It's well, it's not it's not that Google's tracking you, right? Because at that point Google's no longer sending inf- new information based upon any mobile advertising ID, but they've already sent it out, right? And those those brokers have collected it and it's sitting in their data sets. Got it. That makes sense. So, and, and if you if you re-enable your mobile advertising ID, it generates a new one. So then they can start tracking you again, but it's based upon a new mobile advertising ID. I see. I see. And so I think we've been talking about how, and you know, Avantis can help people protect themselves from having their data collected and sold and ha- how to, you know, request purges be made. But what about organizations? What can they do better to protect people's privacy when collecting and using geolocation data? So if you're talking about like a commercial interest, right? I think that's it's pretty interesting. We're we're actually talking with some organizations now about how they need to start thinking about this from a, a threat mitigation situation, right? I mean, especially if you're talking about people that maybe targets in your organization for attack, you know, whether it's the C-suite or your IT personnel or, or other vulnerable individuals where, you know, attackers might come after them, they're going to come after them based upon information that they can find that's publicly available, right? So some of them are actually, you know, going to these data deletion companies and and trying to delete all their information on their C-suite employees, their IT employees. Frankly, they should probably be doing it for all their employees, but at least those ones that are most vulnerable, right? But they're right now they're ignoring all the location data right? Which is a a big vulnerability. So they should be thinking about deleting that location information as well. It's a, it's a big hole. Yeah, definitely. That sounds like a a real security challenge for corporate security. And I do appreciate the answer, but what, what I was trying to get at is like, let's say like maybe should companies, for instance, not collect geolocation data in the first place. Oh, I see what you're saying. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or is there a way to do this in a more manageable way? If they do collect it, is there like a privacy enhancing technology or architecture that can be used to better protect the privacy of people? You know, I'm not sure if I've got a great answer for that. Um, I think maybe the best way to be careful with that data is to not collect the precise geolocation, but collect more vague geolocation information because generally you don't actually need that data to be precise. Is it more like people would not want to know what state you're in and that's that's the level or could it go deeper than that and be county and be okay? Yeah, I mean I think I mean that's not bad, right? I mean it, it's really I mean if you can if you can pinpoint it down to you know a a house level, a you know a uh, I'm not even sure what the actual fine grained level is that's that's problematic, right? But if you were to blur that data out, you know, so that it was within, you know, like miles instead of, you know, feet, you probably would not have an issue with it, right? You know, if it was in within like a mile radius, and it probably varies, you know, if you're in urban or rural areas. But um, it's not going to really change my weather report, right? Um, and it's probably not going to change a lot of other things. Maybe it changes it for the people that are trying to figure out what store you're going to, which could be problematic for for certain applications. But for a lot of use cases, you don't need precise geolocation, but they're storing it anyway. Yeah, that makes sense. That's helpful. I, you know, I do wonder, and if people here are, are, are listening, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to specifically focus on location data. 
I know Provado, the sponsor of this podcast, actually does quite a bit of making sure that you, you could scan your code to make sure that location data is um, behaving as intended and, you know, you're not actually collecting uh, sensitive data when you you know you didn't want to be as an organization or it can put you into risk or harm privacy. But you know, it seems to me that there's definitely an opportunity out there to educate companies on how to protect people and not harm them, you know, especially when it comes to geolocation and precise data. Perhaps it's it's as you say, that you get not precise geolocation data, but work with a uh, a statistician or you know a somebody who can take a look at making sure that data is not identified or re-identifiable, um, making sure that the that the granularity is uh, not going to harm uh, individuals and kind of do that threat identification and, you know, threat model for the product beforehand, before you ever ship. That will do wonders. And you could refer to, to people listening, you could refer to the previous episode on threat modeling uh, with Kim uh, Vutz uh, and, you know, learn a little more about the threat modeling uh, approaches and, and, and when uh. you should do that. But I do think that having the right uh, experts on board to help with whether or not this meets privacy bars and can not just compliance, but can actually protect the people behind the data uh, is pretty essential. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think if you change the granularity, you could you could vastly decrease the re-identifiability of the data, of the location data. Excellent. And it might not be that hard to do, actually. I mean, if you have light longs, you could just lop off, you know, you know, the last few decimal points potentially, and you'd be there. Fascinating. Well, it's good to know it's it, you don't think it's too complex. You know, hopefully this is some food for thought for, uh, you know, the privacy technologists in the audience. Yep. Jeff, is there anything uh, else, any other resources that you would uh, point people to if they're concerned about data brokers or location privacy or, you know, uh, you could also plug you know, your website for uh, <laughs> learning more about privacy data sets? Uh, yeah, well, I think there's a lot of stuff on privacy plan about uh, about data sets. Um, I'd also, uh, you know, say uh, follow me on uh, on LinkedIn, do a lot of posts there. And uh, I also, uh, you know, promote a lot of other people there and, and check out privacy podcasts. I, I've been a little bit negligent, but I, I maintain a huge data set of privacy podcasts. And frankly, shifting left is finally in the data set. So uh, that'll be awesome. Excellent. And um, yeah, I'm going to be doing a... Uh, a top 10 list here uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, Debbie Reynolds has been been uh, on me to, <laughs> to, to redo that uh, because I haven't released one for a while. And uh, I think there's like something like 200 uh, privacy focused uh, podcasts in my data set. That's just so wonderful. I really look forward to that when that comes out, yeah, right? seeing the list. And um, I have looked at the database and I'm really glad that you finally uh, added the shifting privacy left. Uh, we're relevant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're actually not relevant. You're actually uh, high up there now, too. So uh, I haven't I haven't actually pushed the top lists, but uh, you're in there. So that's awesome. Oh, well, that's excellent. It's, it's really great to hear. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm really looking forward to seeing that. And um what else? Let me, before we go, let me have you discuss a little bit of your podcast, Your Bites, Your Rights. Uh, do you mind just, you know, giving us a little overview about the types of things you discuss and when you're, uh, when it takes place and how people can participate? Yeah, we've actually been on hiatus for a bit, but uh, Christian uh, K. Meyer and I are going to be uh, ramping that back up. We actually had a an episode a couple weeks ago. And uh, hopefully we're going to get back on a weekly rhythm. Uh, but Your Bites, Your Rights is uh, sort of a weekly interdisciplinary uh, discussion on uh, on data rights. Uh, and we focus a lot on privacy and data ownership and uh, sort of all the stuff that goes around with that. And we try to bring in people from from not only privacy, but you know just all kinds of different related disciplines to talk about how we can better own and and demand our rights to to our data. 
Yeah. And I've, I've participated in several of those discussions and I've been really enlightening, engaging with other experts in the field. And so I encourage others to attend them once you get them going again. Yeah. Um, no worries taking a hiatus. I took a few off this summer myself. <laughs> There's just so much going on uh, in the field that we just have to remember to that we're human and we can only, we need to rest at times and you can only get done when you get done. But uh, I look forward to participating again. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you were great when when, when you were on. Uh, we we just uh, finished up an episode uh, with uh, Tom Tom Kemp. Sorry, uh, no. Oh yes, uh, Tom Kemp uh, about the uh, Delete Act in California, which uh, which may finally uh, have uh, you know a regulation with some teeth in it on on data brokers. Yes, uh, that's wonderful. He's going to be on the show in a in a, a week and a half, maybe two weeks, actually. In- Recording time, yeah. Awesome. Well, that'll be great. Well, then you'll 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 have all the details on the Delete Act, on the Delete Act, as well as his new book, and um, you know, privacy and big tech. Yep. Uh, which should you know is definitely an interesting book, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when he's on the on the show. And then he's also a seed investor for a whole bunch of privacy tech companies. So he's very interesting individual, and I really look forward to having that conversation. So yeah, I love it that we're we're kind of ta- uh, talking about similar things, you and I, but taking different tacks. And you know, you have this town hall style engaging uh, show where anyone could you know join the LinkedIn Live event and then ask questions or join within that format. So I love it. It's all complimentary and. Um, really enjoy the value that you bring to the field, well, thank you. especially your, your enormous focus on data sets. You know, I, until you came on the scene, I hadn't seen anybody else kind of doing that hard work of pulling it all together and then making it pretty accessible publicly. Well, so thanks for your work. I appreciate that. Well, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll put out some, some new ones and some big ones soon. Well, so. great, Jeff. Uh, do you have any other, uh, you know, words of advice or um, you want anything you want to leave our listeners with before we close? I think uh, just uh, some some kudos to you for uh, for shifting left. Uh, loving the new podcast, and thanks for all you do. Oh, I really appreciate that uh, very much. It's a lot of work. I got a lot of um, personal uh, value and pleasure out of um, having these conversations. So thank you for being on the show, oh. and I'm sure I'll have you back on in the future. Um, you know, there's just so much going on in this space. So good luck to you on the on Avantis and the new consumer location privacy and deletion tool. And I'll be paying attention. Uh, if people wanted to reach out to you and collaborate or or ask questions, is LinkedIn the best place or is there somewhere else that they can go? Uh, LinkedIn is probably the, the easiest way to reach me. Excellent. Well, I'll put a link to that in the show notes and you can have a great day. All right. Take care. Thank you for joining us today on Shifting Privacy Left to discuss privacy data sets, location privacy and data brokers. Thanks for joining us this week on Shifting Privacy Left. Make sure to visit our website, shiftingprivacyleft.com, where you can subscribe to updates so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found this episode valuable, go ahead and share it with a friend. And if you're an engineer who cares passionately about privacy, check out Privato, the developer-friendly privacy platform and sponsor of this show. To learn more, go to privato.ai. Be sure to tune in next Tuesday for a new episode. Bye for now.